In this video, we discuss learning outcome number one of lesson 7.2. My goal is that by the end of this video, you'll be able to describe the characteristics of the student T distribution and find a critical value T sub alpha over two corresponding to a given confidence level. But first let's put that in context. Remember lesson 7.2 is about using sample data to make inferences about a population mean. We're going to do that in two ways. We're going to find a point estimate for the population mean and then we're going to find a confidence interval for the population mean in much the same way that we found a confidence interval um, for our population proportion in lesson 7.1. Um, but here it's going to be a little bit different. In order to compute a confidence interval when that population standard deviation is unknown, which is usually the case, we have to familiarize ourselves with a new distribution called the student t distribution. That's what this video is about. We're going to learn about a student t distribution. We're going to learn about finding critical values um, that um, are on that distribution. And that is going to allow us to compute confidence intervals in the next learning outcome. So that's where we're going, and that's why we started with this. But first, let's review some notation for confidence intervals. This is notation for confidence intervals for estimating a population mean in the case when the population standard deviation sigma is not known. So remember mu represents the population mean. That's the variable we're trying to estimate. N is the number of sample values or sample size. X bar is the sample mean. E is the margin of error. And S still represents the stamp sample standard deviation. Now, I'm just going to give you a preview. We're going to talk about this more in the next, um, next video when we discuss the next learning outcome. But here are some formulas for computing the confidence interval. Under certain conditions, the confidence interval for the population mean can be computed with the, when the population standard deviation is unknown, and it can be computed using these formulas. The population mean mu is going to be between the sample mean minus the margin of error and the sample mean plus the margin of error, where the margin of error is given by this T sub alpha over two times the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. The critical value T sub alpha over two is a value from a distribution called the student T distribution. The distribution itself depends on the sample size N and the critical value will depend on our desired level of confidence. So we need both the sample size and the desired level of confidence in order to find that critical value T sub alpha over two. So the goals of this part of lesson 7.2 are to learn about the student T distribution, to define a term called degrees of freedom. We'll talk about what degrees of freedom represent and how we compute degrees of freedom for confidence interval problems involving pop, uh, population means. And then we will learn how to compute those critical T values, um, which we're going to need when we compute confidence intervals in the next part of lesson 7.2. So here's a little bit of history. The student T distribution was developed by a Guinness Brewery employee, having trouble today, William Seeley Gossett. He needed a distribution that could be used with small samples. Now, the brewery would not allow um, employees to publish research results. So um, William got around this by publishing them under the pseudonym uh, student. So that's why it's called the student T distribution. It was published by student and the student was this brewery. <laughs> I don't know why I have such a hard time with that word brewery uh, employee, William Se Seeley Gossett. And if you want to learn more about him, you can click on his picture and it'll take you to the Wikipedia article about him. Now here are some key features of that distribution. The student T distribution has a slightly different shape for different sample sizes. We'll look at this picture um, just as an example. That green distribution is the normal distribution, the standard normal distribution. When n equals 12, we see the student T distribution is just a little bit less than that. But it's different, right? It's, it's distinctly different from this standard normal distribution. Although it has many of the same properties, it's bell-shaped, it's symmetric. It has a single mode, 
Um, and the student T distribution with N equals three is similar in shape as well, but it's below that. So in general, the student T distribution will have the same shape and symmetry as the standard normal distribution, but it has greater variability. And you might expect that because if you have a very small sample, there's going to be more variation than if you had um, uh, larger samples. You'd expect more variation if you have, you know, n equals three values or n equals 15 values than you would if you were looking at sample means and you had n equals 100 values. So I'd expect a lot more variation when samples are small. So the student t distribution um, allows us to um, describe that distribution of data when the samples are small. Now, if the original population has a normal distribution, then the distribution of the random variable given by t equals x bar, that is the sample mean that and those values that are used to compute the sample mean come from a population with a normal distribution. Sample mean minus mu divided by this sample standard deviation divided by the square root of n, um, a distribution of that variable t is called the student t distribution. And we saw some of the graphs. Sometimes it's just called the t distribution. Sometimes you'll even see it called students t distribution because student is the one who came up with it. I think people like to tell that story because it's a cool story. Now, if you want to see a little bit more about how this student t distribution is related to the standard normal distribution, you can click here and it'll take you to the Desmos interactive graph. I am not going to click here while I'm doing this um, video for you, but I'll just open it up in a different window. Here we go. Now, I did not create this. Somebody else took the time to create this. But this red curve um, is the graph of the population or the probability uh, density function for the um, standard normal distribution. So that red curve is our typical um, bell curve for the standard normal. Uh, here the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. But if you wanted, you could look at what the normal distribution would look like with a different mean or a different standard deviation. So if you wanted to see, let's say the one for IQ scores, you could change the mean to 100 and the standard deviation to 15. Um, let's, let's actually do that. So we'll have 100 here and then 15 over here. And we're looking for that red graph. I think we're gonna have to go all the way out toward 100. <laughs> you see it starting to grow. We're way off in the left tail of that distribution. Oh, and because of the scale, you can't really see what's going on. Never mind. <laughs> let's go back to a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And actually, let's go back to the, the original graph. So let's reload this. But you can theoretically play with it. You're just going to have to zoom in and zoom out in order to see the graphs. OK, so we're here. And we've got this red curve, which is the standard normal distribution. And this blue curve below it is the distribution or the probability density function for the distribution um, associated with the student t distribution. So this is the student t. It's given by this formula. It looks pretty complicated. And I, will never even I, I would have never even shown it to you if I didn't um, want to show you this graph over here. But this is the formula that's being used to generate this graph. And this is where what I wanted to show you. This, oops, there's a space missing there. This slider will allow you to see different student t distributions for different sample sizes. So that blue one is the student t distribution with n equals four. So that means you only have four um, values in your sample. Maybe you only have two or two values in your sample. That's what the student t looks like. See how it's very symmetric. It still has a mean of zero, but the standard deviation is larger. 
it's maybe not obvious to you that the standard deviation is larger, but you see how this um, left tail and the right tail are a little bit thicker? It's because the data is more spread out. If it's spread out more, that's more variation. And if there's more variation, that's measured with things like standard deviation and variance. Um, so there's more variation in the student t distribution. So that standard deviation is going to be greater than one, whereas the standard deviation for the standard normal, the red curve, is equal to one. Now let's look at what happens as n increases. So in, oops, there's n equals three, n equals four, n equals five, n equals seven. See, as n goes on, as n grows, that student t distribution gets closer and closer to that normal distribution. And this is pretty cool. If you just press this little um, button here, it'll run backwards and forwards. So you can see, it shows not going so fast, that as the sample size increases, that student t distribution gets closer and closer to that standard normal distribution. Now that link is in these slides. So you can check out those slides um, and play with that little interactive graph yourself if you want to. You can even change the mean and the standard deviation um, on the standard normal distribution. You just have to zoom in or zoom out in order to see the, the big picture. Okay. So let's talk about some of the key features of that student t distribution that we just saw. First, it has the same general symmetric bell shape as a standard normal distribution, but it has more variability. So the standard deviation is greater than one, um, which is what we would expect with smaller samples. I would expect more variability if my samples are small. If I select four values, and then I select four different values, and I select four different values, well, there's gonna be more variation in that than if I had selected 100 values and then selected 100 values. I hope that makes sense. It makes intuitive sense to me. The mean of the student t distribution is t equals zero. And again, the standard deviation varies with sample size, um, but the standard deviation is greater than one. Turns out there is less variation the larger the sample. And as that sample size gets larger, the student T distribution gets closer to the standard normal distribution. Okay, now in order to compute the confidence interval that we're going to compute for the population mean in the next video, we need to be able to find this critical value T sub alpha over two. Now this serves the same purpose as the critical value Z sub alpha over two, but the T critical T values are going to take on different values than Z sub alpha over two because the student t distribution depends on the sample size. So the value for t sub alpha over two, just like z sub alpha over two, separates the top alpha over two area from the rest of the area under the curve. And here's an example. When n is equal to 15, we got a student t distribution that looks like this. If we have a confidence level of 95%, just like with our critical value for z sub alpha over two, we want 95% of that area in the middle. So we want 95% of those sort of typical values of the sample mean in this case. And then we want the remaining 5% of the area to go into the two tails. So you have two and a half percent on the left tail and two and a half percent on the right tail. The question is, well, what is the T value for n equals 15, we're looking at the student t distribution that separates that top two and a half percent from that bottom 97 and a half percent of the area, or this top area of 0 0.025 from the bottom area of 0. Point <coughs> excuse me, 0.975. It turns out that that t value, t sub alpha over two, is 2.145. Now, I don't know if you remember this, but if we were looking for z sub alpha over two, corresponding with a confidence interval of 95%. The T or Z sub alpha over two is 1.96. So that, this is just saying that we have to go out a few more standard deviations, or excuse me, these are not standard deviations anymore. We have to go out to this um, T value in order to capture that same area. Whereas we only had to go out 1.96 standard deviations um, 
when we were looking at the standard normal distribution. So the student T distribution and the standard normal distribution are playing the same role here, but the values are different because the standard deviation of the student T distribution is not equal to one. It's a little bit more than one. But we're still, if we're looking at 95% confidence interval, we're still trying to capture those sort of common values of the sample mean in the middle, those 95% of common values. And then we want to say all the, the um, sample means that are um, significantly high or significantly low, they're going to be out in this, this tail or in this tail, in that top 2.5% or the bottom 2.5%. Um, and the critical value that separates those typical values of the sample mean from those atypical values, those significant values, significantly higher, significantly low values of the sample mean. Well, that's T sub alpha over two. So that's 2.145 in this case for N equals 15 in this confidence level. Or uh, the T value over here, because of symmetry, this T value would be negative 2.145. Okay. So the student T distribution is different from sample size to sample size. As n changes, we need a, a different distribution. The shape changes as the sample size changes. So sometimes instead of calling this a student t distribution, I will call it the student t distributions because there's more than one and there are infinitely many, one for each possible sample size. And you just go on forever. Um, and we'll, basically we just need to know um, which one to choose we need to choose the correct one. Um, the various distributions are not typically identified by sample size. They're identified by what's called the degrees of freedom associated with our data set. The degrees of freedom is abbreviated DF. The number of degrees of freedom for a data set is given by this. This is the number of sample values that can vary after certain restrictions have been imposed on all data values. In this context, when we're talking about constructing confidence intervals and we're trying to find T sub alpha over two uh, for a particular, um, well, for a particular confidence interval, we're going to need this degrees of freedom um, equal to N minus one. And if you're wondering why N minus one, it's very similar to something that we talked about earlier. And then I don't remember which, um, which lesson it was associated with. But we talked about this idea that if you have n values in your data set, you're free to choose n minus one of them, but the last one, you're kind of stuck with it. Um, it always reminds me of, whenever I think of degrees of freedom, it always reminds me of this, this idea that no one likes being picked last. If you've ever been, if you're ever a kid playing like dodgeball at school, and people were picking teams. Someone picked a person for the team and someone picked a person for the team and someone picked a person for the team. And if there were 16 students, 15 of those students were chosen and then the last guy was just stuck on whatever team um, was next, right? So there were only 15 choices if there were 16 students. In the same way, if we've got N sample values, we're free to choose N minus one of them. So those are the degrees of freedom um, for our purposes in this course, or for our purposes in this section on um, confidence intervals of population means. In other sections, we're going to um, use this definition. Um, this definition that I just gave you is a special case of this definition. The number of degrees of freedom is the number of sample values that can vary after certain restrictions have been imposed on all values. So it's basically which ones can, can you choose? That's how I think of it. How many of these values can I choose? If I've got N of them, I can choose N minus one of them before I'm stuck with the last one. Um, so that no one likes being picked last um, will hopefully remind you that degrees of freedom is not the sample size, but the sample size minus one because you can't pick the last one. You're stuck with it. Okay, so now let's talk about finding this critical value T sub alpha over two. Here we want to find the critical value T sub alpha over two corresponding to a 95% confidence level given that the sample size has, has, or the sample has size, excuse me, N equals 18. 
So first, what I always do with any problem where I'm asked to find a critical value um, of z or a critical value of t is I sketch a distribution. In this case, I'm just going to sketch a bell-shaped distribution and I'm going to label the middle 95% of the area. Because if I want a 95% confidence level, I want 95% of those sample means in this case to fall in the middle of my distribution. So this is the graph I came up with. If you click here, it'll take you to a website called mathcracker.com. Um, it allowed me to uh, sketch the student t distribution. Um, I wanted 95% of the area in the middle. And then we've got that 5% of the area in the two tails. This is the distribution for n equals 18. Now, if you don't have um, contrast with n equals 18 and n equals 20 and n equals four, and then the standard normal distribution on this, it just looks like another bell-shaped distribution. They're all gonna have basically the same shape. Um, but know that they're slightly different for different sample sizes when you're talking about student t distribution. And then of course, all of those are slightly different from the standard normal distribution. Okay, so we're trying to find that critical t value. We sketch our distribution, we label that 95% of the area in the middle and the t sub alpha over two is this t value right there. So we want the t value that separates that top two and a half percent of the area from that bottom 97.5% of the area. The next thing we do is compute the degrees of freedom and alpha. Well, um, if our sample size is 18, I'm free to choose 17 of those values. So the, degree of, the degrees of freedom for this problem are 18 minus one, which is 17, and alpha comes from the confidence level. If we, have, we wanna have 95% confidence, the alpha is the complement of that, but in decimal form, that's 0 0.05. And I've also listed that this is the area in two tails. So it means I've got 5% of my area in the two tails. And of course that's two and a half percent in the left tail and two and a half percent in the right tail. Um, but I'm listing area in two tails because of the way um, critical T values are listed on our table. Um, and that formulas and tables um, handout from Mr. Triola. Now, once you have your degrees of freedom and then you've used your confidence level to find alpha, in this case, we just need alpha, which is the area in two tails. Now you wanna use table A3 or Excel to find the critical value. First, I'm going to use Excel. So I'll go over here. And in Excel, the function that you need is t.inv. So that means we're not going to give them a t value and ask for the, the area to the left or the right. Rather than doing that, we want the inverse. So what we want is um, area corresponding, or instead of asking for area corresponding to a given t value, we want a t value corresponding to a given area. So that's why we need the inverse function. So we use t.inv for inverse. And I'm looking for area in two tails. So you actually type dot 2t oops, for two tails. And it pops up on that list too as you're typing in Excel. So, so you'll see um, a reminder from Excel of the possible functions or the functions that are available. So I want t inverse and two tails, open parentheses. And then the Excel's um, little reminder uh, tooltip here says the next thing you're supposed to enter is the probability and then the degrees of freedom. The probability again is the same as the area under the curve and we want the area in the two tails. So the area in two tails was 0 0.05 because we had a 95% confidence interval. The probability is the same as your alpha level, um, but it's in decimal form. And uh, then we want the degrees of freedom. N was equal to 18, so we can, are free to choose 17 values. So the degrees of freedom is 17, R17. And then you hit enter and you get 2.1098 or for rounding to three decimal places because that's what you'll have in your table. Oops, that's not what I wanted. Let's go here, that's what I want. And then I wanted fewer decimal places. If we round to three decimal places, we get T sub alpha over two is approximately 2.110. So that's what we've got there. Use that function. 
the tooltip will remind you. You want the probability, which is the same as the area and two tails, and the degrees of freedom. And it gives you uh, 2.110. That's the first method. The second method is to use table A3. So you're going to bring up your table. And this is an eight page long table. This is the one that's got your positive z-scores and your negative z-scores on it. After the positive and negative z-scores, you'll have your um, critical t-values. In this first column, the degrees of freedom are listed. Now we actually don't have a complete table um, of positive and negative t-values like we do for our z-scores, um, but we do have critical t-values for different areas and two tails or areas and one tail. So I, I'll go over here to degrees of freedom. My sample size was 18, so I've got 17 degrees of freedom. And then to find the right critical T value, I look at these um, columns, these column headings at the top. The area in two tails was 5% or 0 0.05 because we had a 95% confidence interval. So that means we're in this column. Or you could say, what's the area in one tail? Well, it's two and a half percent. Notice that the area in one tail being two and a half percent and the area in two tails being 5% or 0 0.05, it's the same column. And that should be, because if I double this, I get this. So I wanna be in the middle column and I wanna be in the row associated with 17 degrees of freedom. Actually, let me zoom in a little bit before we do this. So there's 17 degrees of freedom. And I want that middle value because I've got the area in two tails of 5%. And there's my uh, T sub alpha over 2, 2.110. 2 OK. Sorry, I didn't mean to sh just focus on my own face for a second there. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. All right, so if you use table A3, you go to the correct row, you go to the correct column, you find out where the row and the column intersect, and you find that T sub 0 0.025, which is the T score associated with an area of 0 0.025 to the right and 0 0.975 to the left, um, that critical T value is 2.110, exactly the same answer that we got using Excel. Now remember what we're doing, this t-score, this critical t-value, is in the definition of the um, formula for margin of error for our confidence intervals um, for the population mean when the standard deviation of the population is unknown. So um, this is just getting us ready for what we're about to do in the next um, lesson when we learn to construct confidence intervals.